All right, welcome to part two. We're talking about fuel systems and kind of the, the evolution of fuel systems on automotive vehicles. So we left off with sequential port fuel injection, kind of this overview of that system. Um, and now let's move on. So here's a picture of that fuel rail. This is uh, sequential port fuel injection on the Honda motor. This is your common rail. Um, you know, you hear the term common rail. Here's your injectors, little solenoids right here we talked about earlier. Remember, we send current through those coils. Anytime you send current through a conductor, you're creating an electromagnetic field. And then um, when um, you wrap that conductor in a coil, you make the magnetic field larger. And that allows us to move these pintles or plungers and spray fuel into the engine. So much more accurate, much more finely tunable um, type of components. But still, there's a there's a better a better way. Always always better. So. Latest developments, we're going into gasoline direct injection. So instead of ejecting fuel on the back of the intake valve, we're actually going to start spraying fuel in directly into the combustion chamber. Uh, of course, this takes very high pressure, uh, 2,000 PSI and up. Um, some of them can get up 25, 30,000 PSI in some common rail diesels, so and even higher. Um, this stuff gets up to dangerously high. So if it's leaking or they're not installed correctly, it can be quite dangerous and you can have diesel or gasoline injected into your skin to cause uh, blood poisoning. So so many systems are, are they're much more efficient, more power, more fuel, better fuel economy, less emissions, but um, again, there can be dangerous. You're kind of you know, threading that needle. So um, <clears throat> basically what you have, like you have your spark plug in the combustion chamber. You also now have the injector right there in the combustion chamber. They take a special Teflon seals around here. They have to be sized. They have to replace the metal on the fuel over here. The line, the, the metal there is a crush, designed crushed metal. So once you torque it, it's it, it's done. You can't reuse it. If you take the fuel line off, it has to be replaced. So everything becomes much more expensive and labor intense on these vehicles. So they had that injection spray right in the combustion chamber instead of sequential port, which is up here. And it would spray down into the back of the intake valve. Uh, and now actually modern vehicles with GDI have sequential port fuel injection also. They use both for depending on load and demand on the engine. Uh, sometimes direct injection is better, sometimes sequential port fuel injection is better. So it just depends on the dynamics and loads of the engine. Um, except like cold start, um, if the engine's cold or if it's hot, again, they'll kind of dance, dance back and forth on what's best for the engine under each dynamic load. <clears throat> so here's that evolution again. You got carburetor, that's using the basic Venturi effect as air, atmospheric air speeds up right here. It creates a pressure drop, and again, using that pressure drop. With atmospheric pressure pushing fuel in, we can atomize fuel coming into the engine as an air fuel charge um, into the combustion chamber. We change that to an injector where we spray it directly on the back of the intake valve right there. And then there's direct injection. Uh, again, you know, kind of late 90s, early 2000s started seeing these, these pop up. Took uh, got real popular in the last uh, 10 years for sure. Um, they had their problems. Um, the back of the intake valve would carbon up and get some deposits on it that had to be cleaned. Otherwise, the engine would misfire. But again, modern ones use sequential port fuel injection and direct injection to kind of keep the intake valve clean. Runs better on startup, runs better high RPM, etc. Okay, but in order to make all this work, I mentioned earlier that it's kind of like I, I, life support. I use the term life support um, just because it's kind of artificial. Carburetors work because of physics. You have atmospheric pressure. It works very similar how you drink, you know, um, soda out of a glass with a straw when you suck fluid through the straw you're not really sucking the fluid up through the straw you're creating less than atmospheric pressure in your mouth um, you know in your kind of diaphragm your mouth area what happens the atmospheric pressure pushes on the fluid and that pushes it up into the straw out of the mouth so carburetors work on that kind of same principle with the venturi effect um, and they work because they work like i said it's just, it's just physics when we started artificially spraying fuel on demand we had to have sensors we had to have computer control so basic powertrain control module operation requires these inputs and outputs and a processing unit central processing unit uh, it used to be called the brain i used to i laugh because that was when i first started wrenching that's what uh, people referred to it as uh, but that was in the 80s 90s you know um, etc so yeah we don't use the brain anymore but what's interesting if you've ever heard of the term biomimicry that's basically what's going on here and biomimicry is where, you know, you look around in nature for inspirational ideas to design something. Somebody, you know, I mean, the basic human body, our senses, we, we're, 
we're a walking processor. We take, uh, you know, so our five senses in, uh, we process that data and then we have outputs like muscles and commands and speech and we do things. So that's what the car's doing. We take these, these input digital analog that comes into the computer. The computer then processes it based on whoever programmed it to do outputs. So some inputs, um, can be like temperature sensor, throttle position sensor, a accelerator pedal position sensor, atmospheric, uh, temperature, uh, you know, I call it ambient air temperature. Uh, and then some outputs could be fuel injector. Um, you know, you have, uh, other actuators, um, et cetera. So <clears throat> the big five inputs though, throttle position sensor, the, uh, map, you have basically manifold absolute pressure that tells the pressure of the, the intake manifold math, mass airflow. So we're, we're measuring the airflow coming in, um, typically a, a hot wire. And then there's VAF, V, uh, vein airflow. This is an older technology where actual door moves. So air comes in, it moves a door on a spring that operates a sweep. And then that kind of tells the computer how much air is coming in. Very archaic and old mechanical. Uh, we don't use those anymore. Uh, then there's ECT, engine coolant temperature, and IET, intake air temperature. That's your ambient air temperature. CKP, crankshaft, and then there's also CAM, which is CMP. And then the um, that tells the computer the position of the crankshaft and camshaft. It needs to know um, that in order to know where it's at in the four stroke process. And then O2 sensor, basically you take throttle position sensor, manifold absolute pressure, mass airflow, how much air is coming in, what temperature is the engine, what temperature is the air, what position is the engine in, camshaft in relation of that four stroke process. All of that data goes into the computer and it has an output. And it says, okay, this is how much fuel we need and when. It tells it, it tells the injector, you know, for command it on or off and for how long. The O2 sensor is an input to where it's kind of a tattletale sensor. What that sensor does in the exhaust is it monitors the oxygen in the exhaust compared to the oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, and it can determine if it's lean or rich. Um, this goes into a whole other conversation about um, traditional zirconia O2 sensors and wideband uh, modern O2 sensors. But basically the gist is these sensors uh, will, will monitor again that oxygen and exhaust and the computer and the sensor isn't really, really accurate when these came out. So the computer couldn't determine how rich or lean. It just can determine that it was rich or lean. So what it did was uh, it would command the system rich and lean on purpose, kind of zigzag pattern, and it would oscillate. Um, and that, that way it can I guess, shoot the average of what the catalytic converter needed, what the engine needed, and everybody was kind of relatively happy. It was easier than guessing and guessing wrong. So if you kind of shot the average, went a little rich, a little lean, and kept going back and forth, the computer uh, or the engine would run a little smoother. It's kind of what they did up until the last 10 years. Well, 15 years. <clears throat> so here's your throttle position sensor. Basically right here on the throttle body, you have the sensor goes across the shaft to that cable. This is what you're operating with your pedal right here. And as that opens and closes, it's gonna sweep uh, change a sweep right here and it sends out a signal that looks similar to the one on the bottom left right here as you open up the throttle it increases and as you close it, it decreases if there's a glitch in the sweep you get these little glitches right here that can cause a hiccup or a stumble and here's what it physically looks like the tp sensor um, <clears throat> and then there's airflow manifold absolute pressure sensor uh, intake manifold uh, this is speed density honda uses this system a lot and then there's mass airflow sensor where it uses a, um, a wire that's been heated up and the computer monitors how much current is coming through that and it can determine based on a little sample tube uh, how much air in grams a second or, or various different ways it measures how much air is coming into the engine. Vein airflow is the same thing but it's mechanical. It just, again, it moves a door and operates a sensor sweep very similar to the throttle position sensor. Uh, again, a bit overkill for this class but um, just showing you how complicated some of these inputs are that were never necessary for carburetor, but the trade-off is we have a much more fuel-efficient um, vehicle that we can get a lot more power out of. So it's a win-win, it really is. Uh, engine coolant temperature, these are just variable resistors. They change with engine coolant temperature, The I mean the resistance by definition. The computer uses these two-wire sensors. Uh, well, they're all two-wire now. Um, there was some earlier one-wire ones that used the thread as a ground signal, but this one has uh, its own dedicated signal ground. Uh, basically, the computer is going to use this sensor to determine the temperature of the engine to adjust fuel trims. And then as air comes in, there's an intake air temperature, works the same as an ECT. 
uh, or transmission fluid temperature TFT. They all work the same. Once you learn how one works, you got it nailed. So computer has these sensors everywhere again, giving it data so it can make a correct calculation on air fuel ratio. And then crankshaft position sensor, camshaft position sensor. Here's a basically a DSO or digital storage oscilloscope showing you the difference cam one, cam two, and crank. This shows you top dead center uh, or 60 degrees before top dead center. This is top dead center of cylinder of compression one, which is bank one. Sorry, camshaft sensor one, bank one right here. So the computer monitors all of these oscillations. It can tell where, again, the 60 degrees before top dead center is, top dead center of cylinder four in a compression stroke and cylinder one, etc. So knows when to fire those injectors and uh, spark plugs. And then here's your tattletale sensor. I mentioned it goes rich and lean, rich and lean. It'll show this oscillating rich and lean, rich and lean generation. The sensor actually generates voltage in the absence of oxygen in the exhaust. So the richer the system, you get higher voltage. <clears throat> so all of these sensors, as you can imagine, um, they break. You know, things we make break and somebody has to fix it. That's where, you know, you come in. That's where I came in. We can get out there to make some money, uh, honest money, good money. Uh, but without some type of computer system to tell us where the fault is, I mean, you, you can imagine how many connectors, wires, and uh, places to look for a fault. It would, it would, it would take you forever. It would be the equivalent of looking in a room full of hay for a needle, you know, as the old adage goes, a needle in a haystack. What Diagnostic Data Link does, it allows you to plug in your computer, and they, they change. They look different. Uh, some of these are older ones. Um, but pre-96, they can be located anywhere. They look very different by manufacturer. Post-96, when they went to OBD2, they're under the dash by the steering wheel by your knee bolsters. Some cars had them under the passenger knee bolster, but they were had to be so many inches from the center of the car, so so far up from the, the floor of the car, had to have the right type of connector. The, the protocol the language on the computer scan tool had to be similar. So this allowed kind of a standardization. But the gist of this was, uh, instead of looking in a room for a needle in a haystack, you get a code. And the code would say, hey, it's on the left side of the room. And that was kind of your basic old OBD1 car. Um, very archaic. Codes weren't very accurate. But as time went on, technology got better. Those codes became much more accurate. So they could say, hey, it's in the, the, you know, the first quadrant left side in the back of this room uh, under the chair. But you still have to go look for the problem. Like if a rat chewed through a wire, it doesn't tell you there's a, you know, rat chewed through a wire underneath the, you know, driver's seat in this area. You still have to go find it. It just tells you the generalized problem that the computers noticed. And that's the gist of scan tools. Um, DTCs, diagnostic trouble codes. Freeze frame data gives you a snapshot of the, those inputs, those sensors. So you can go recreate that. Uh, and then there's, of course, um, the bi-directional control. I can control some of those outputs like injectors and actuators. Here's some common scan tools from uh, a few years ago. The, but most, most scan tools now use a laptop base. That's an old laptop picture, but the, the same is still true. It has an interface um, device right here where it, uh, basically this is a, a translation tool to change the, the language of protocol from the car to the laptop. They don't jive. This is a translation tool to make them all speak on the same page. Um, cost anywhere under 50 bucks to read just your DTCs to thousands of dollars, a couple grand for a manufacturer one, and then you got to spend a thousand a year for updates. But then you can actually do much more advanced stuff like reprogram the computer um, and bi-directional communication of every system in the car, not just emission-related systems. So <clears throat> here you go, WDS. That's what I started off at Ford using. That big cart would roll around. You would unplug this. And then take that with you and scan it. And then we went to this laptop-based one right here. Um, but that's basically it. So uh, if you have any questions, email me. Again, my name uh, or my email is in the syllabus. Um, hope you enjoy this introduction into fuel systems, kind of an overview evolution of the automotive fuel system from carburetor to direct injection and some little bit intro into scan tool data. You can email me if you have any questions. All right. See you next week.